This morning, brothers and sisters, we are continuing on with our look at Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 this time. We'll look at chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. So, as we talked about last week, Paul has laid out for us so many things about who we are in Christ and what that means. And last week we talked about how we are called to pray for one another just as Paul prayed fervently for the church in Ephesus and by extension he called all of us to pray for one another as well. But then he continues on and uh, he this, this first little bit, as a prisoner for the Lord then, it is kind of like uh, reminding the Ephesians a little bit about his qualifications, not because he wants to brag, but because he wants to remind them that he speaks with the authority of God given to him, and that is proved in part by the fact that he has been willing to sacrifice everything for God, including his own freedom, and we'll find out eventually um, his, his own life as well. We believe that Paul was martyred as well. So he says, as a prisoner for the Lord then, verse 1, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. There, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all, but to each one of you, to each one of us, excuse me, grace has been given as Christ apportioned. This is why it said, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then, we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The word of the Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I don't want you to think that this is purely a recruitment sermon, uh, but, you know, Keep it in your minds that God calls each of us and gives us gifts that we may serve God and serve one another. But before we get to what God's calling may be for you and I, we need to talk about the reality again of what God has given us and who he has made us to be and consequently who he calls us to be. And so let us go step by step through this passage and unpack some of it together. 
He urges us right away, Paul, by his authority, which is, is testified to by his, the fact that he is a prisoner for the Lord. He urges us to live a life worthy of the calling that we have received. What is the calling that we have received? The calling we have received is to be God's witnesses of the good news of Jesus Christ throughout the world. Right? That is what God called us to do. God did not call us to have private, individual relationship with God and never talk about our faith and never have it make any difference in our lives. God says very clearly through Jesus Christ at the end of the Gospels and the beginning of Acts that he has called us to go into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, sharing the good news and baptizing people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is what God has called us to do. And not just the professionals among us, not just the pastors, not just the VBS volunteers who are awesome and great, not just the missionaries who are out there in some part of the world that we're not familiar with, not just the Sunday school volunteers, not just the GEMS counselors, but every single one of us, old or young, mature or immature, we have all been called to grow in and share the good news of Jesus. But what does living a life worthy of that calling mean? And it's interesting because the things that he says are not maybe the things that you would find in a church growth handbook or the things you would maybe find in, in a, uh, a, a book about how to do missions or whatever. These things, the, the life that we have been wor or that we have been called to, that we are called to live worthily of, are, are things that are, are awesome, but not strategic from the world's standpoint. Be completely humble and gentle. Not be a great salesperson. Not have all the answers. Not walk around like you've got everything together. Not pretend like you, have <laughs> you are much holier than those around you. No, no, no. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Hoy, when I look at these things, I'm thinking almost immediately that I've got a lot of work to do. Right? If this is what it means, if this is part of what it means to be living worthily of the calling that we have been given, then I've got some work to do. And chances are you do too. I remember at Calvin... <coughs> One of the things we studied was church history, and particularly history of the Christian Reformed Church, of course. A and one of the things that a professor gave us was a family tree of churches in sort of the Western world. And this is downright depressing, I have to say. So you've got, uh, way back in like the 300s or something, the, the Roman Catholic Church uh, broke off from the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, that happened over something called the Filioque Clause in the Nicene Creed. I don't need to go through that with you particularly. It's fun. You should look it up if you can spell Filioque, which I can't. Anyways, um, they split over that. And then the Eastern Orthodox Church, because really it was kind of a power play by the Roman Catholic Church. They wanted more power, and they were worried that the, the Eastern Church, which was centered in Byzantium, uh, Constantinople, sorry, uh, that they were going to uh, 
take more of the power, right? So they split off. But then the Eastern Orthodox Church, they split a little bit, but it's mostly along geographic lines and or because of um, political realities, like, for example, when the Soviet Union was formed, the Russian Orthodox Church got cut off from everybody else because uh, they were essentially outlawed, right? But generally, they stay pretty good, uh, stay pretty much together. That side of the branch of Christianity uh, is pretty unified. There's only a couple of different branches. But then, of course, in the, in the West, in the Roman Catholic branch, we have, uh, you know, when, when Martin Luther comes along and there's his 95 theses, then there's a split. And then very shortly thereafter, there's the Arminians and there's the Reformed and there's uh, the, the, the splitting just goes on and on and on and on and on. So that there are literally thousands of denominations that have come out of an inheritance of splitting and division on that side of the family tree. And we've seen that in our own denomination. Right? I remember very much the mid 90s, mid to late 90s, when we were splitting. I grew up in Sarnia, and uh, I remember families being s driven apart by the debate over women serving in various offices of the church. I remember whole churches exploding. We lost tens of thousands of members across the denomination because of that debate. And, and I am absolutely certain that there were many people within the CRC who were genuinely trying to keep the unity of the church that were genuinely trying to do what Paul calls them to do. They were making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit from the through the bond of peace. I know that there were people, many people, on both sides of that equation, uh, about that question, rather, about whether women should serve in these offices or not, and so on. There were people all over who were trying to keep the bond of peace. But sadly, in our brokenness, we didn't manage to fully do that. And that was heartbreaking. And there are always questions that threaten to shatter our denomination. And there are always debates that we have that threaten to pull us apart. And sometimes, just like Martin Luther, there is, there is a time when we must say, here I stand, I can do no other. And we must part ways. But Paul says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And he says, bear with one another in love. Be gentle, be patient, be humble. And so I know that the evidence is that we all have a long way to go on that. It's very much like Jesus' cry out in the Garden of Gethsemane that he prays that we may be one just as Jesus and the Father are one. And, and Paul goes on and says, there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And so Paul calls the Ephesians. And God, through Paul's words to the Ephesians, calls us to make every effort to be humble and gentle 
and patient and bear with one another in love. And I am so grateful to say that there are so many times in the years since my growing up and, you know, while I was growing up too, where I've witnessed that with so many people. And it is wonderful and beautiful when we disagree about something and yet we approach it humbly and gently and patiently and bear with one another in love and we make those efforts to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. This is one of the graces that God has given us, that we can do that. We are empowered to do that. But Paul goes on to explain a little bit about that grace some more. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. We have been given so many gifts. Well, just uh, explain as Paul goes on, what does he ascended mean? It, this is parenthetical. It's, it's sort of, again, Paul going off on a little bit of a tangent, right? What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? That's here, right? Uh, he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens. And remember that when, when the Jewish people and when the Greek people were talking about the heavens, they were talking not just about the, the heavens as in the place where God dwells, but they were speaking about the sky and then about the stars and those heavenly realms. And then above that is the dwelling where God lives, right? The heavenly realms, which includes uh, not only the place where God dwells, but the whole spiritual realm as well. So God ascended, Jesus ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So, then Paul goes back to the point. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Brothers and sisters, who is excluded from that from among Christians? Is anyone excluded from that little, well, large sentence? No. Right? It, it may seem at first glance that, that Paul is talking about, oh, just the leaders, the apostles, the, the pastors, the evangelists, the teachers. No, no, no. But that's not what he's talking about alone. Yes, those people were given to us to help us grow and mature in Christ. But th that's the point. For everyone to grow so that we may serve God. Right? For everyone to grow so that we may serve God. Equip his people for works of service so that we may all be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. I'm going to share something that may be a little bit controversial to you, uh, but maybe not. Uh, but I believe it's God, God's word, God, godly. I believe it's godly. And so here we go. So <clears throat> Gwyneth and I, uh, Gwyneth grew up, as you know, uh, in the Baptist tradition, right? She grew up in a church that believed uh, much the same theology as we do uh, on the vast majority of things. We had big differences uh, in terms of theology on baptism and what it means, and when it should be done. Uh, her church believes, or her denomination as she grew up, believes very much that you should only baptize people who are believers, which means that they have reached uh, uh, some age where they can discern um, and understand the message of the gospel and choose for themselves to accept Jesus as their Savior. 
our church, our denomination, believes that, um, yes, that is good and wonderful and great, but it doesn't necessarily need to be only the, the believer who is baptized, but also we believe that through the covenant, just as God included the children of Israel through circumcision, so too God includes the children of believers in the covenant of baptism as well. It's a difference in theology. It is a difference in theology that the church, in a way, has been fighting about for at least 500 years. And nobody that I know of, and please point one out if you can come up with one, nobody has come with the knockout punch, theologically speaking, that convinces everybody else that theirs is the correct theology on this matter. Right? Nobody's come out and said, oh, hey, look, this is the final biblical interpretation. If you just look at it this way, you'll all understand and we won't be fighting about this anymore. Now, thankfully, things have changed quite a bit where generally we don't look at each other with great vitriol and hate uh, because we believe differently about baptism. You've even welcomed Gwyneth into our church, and, you know, I reformed her. <laughs> right? But, but, <laughs> not, not really. But, uh, but the, the reality is that we, as Baptists and as Christian Reformed people, we all believe in Jesus Christ as the Lord. We all believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Trinity, one God in three persons. We all believe that salvation is through Jesus alone. We all believe in his love and in his promises and his righteousness and holiness. We all accept the Bible as the word of God. We all are there on the same page about all the stuff that really matters. I mean, do we really think that we're going to get to the gates of heaven and St. Peter, who are, whoever's at the gate of heaven, goes, oh, are you an infant Baptist person or are you a believer's only Baptist person? And if you give the wrong answer, God is going to say, mm -hmm, sorry, you didn't make it. Right? That is not going to happen. And yet, as denominations, we continue to draw more and more lines between ourselves and put up more and more fences instead of breaking them down. Here's the thing that's controversial, and it will probably never happen in this world. But why does there have to be a Christian Reformed denomination and a Fellowship Baptist denomination when the only difference is what we believe about baptism? Why couldn't there be room for us to practice within our own discretion both of those things within the same church? I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm not advocating that we dissolve our church and become part of the Baptist denomination or, or that the Baptist should, you know, whatever. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying, think about it. Why couldn't there be room for that? Why do we have to say, no, you may not be part of us because of this? Is there really a logical reason why that must be so? Now, of course, we are, are relatively powerless on a denominational standpoint, but on an individual standpoint, the, 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 the thing is still there. Right? We all have our different preferences and beliefs, and sometimes they are very, very vehement. 
we believe sometimes very strongly that we ought to do things in a certain way, uh, uh, maybe because that's always the way we've done it, or maybe because we have done all the research and the work and we've struggled and we've wrestled and we believe that this is the right way to do it, but then we are confronted by someone who believes differently, who is still very much a person who loves the Lord, who is still very much a person who holds high the authority of Scripture, who still very much believes in Jesus Christ as their Savior, and yet they seem to believe something very different than us. And what do we do? Do we say, you can no longer be part of me? Or do we keep, make every effort to give, to keep the bond of peace? This is part of that maturity that we are called to grow into. See, we cannot serve one another or the world around us if we are busy fighting with each other. You see, when Paul goes on and says in verse 14, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. When Paul says that, he's talking about the realities of creation versus uh, evolution. And how there are Christ followers who believe in the authority of Scripture very, very strongly and who believe that God created the world in six 24-hour days. And there are Christ followers who believe very strongly in the authority of Scripture and who love God and who accept Jesus as their personal Savior, who believe that God utilized the mechanisms of evolution that he set in place in order to create this world. There are both. And there are people all over the spectrum in between. And if we dig in our heels and fight about it, then we are going to be tossed about by every wave. What happens to your faith in God if you are proved wrong about your belief on infant versus adult baptism or believer's baptism? What happens to your faith if you are proved wrong that contemporary music is totally okay and good? What if you are proved wrong about whether God created the world in six 24-hour days and the world is only 6,000 years long? Or what if you are proved wrong about God using the mechanisms of evolution? What happens to your faith? You're tossed about. But if you are mature, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to let all your beliefs go out of your head and not believe anything. That's not true. You will be able to hold on to what you believe is true without fear and speak of it humbly and gently, bearing with one another in love. And in hearing you who has different beliefs from me, we will both be able to grow. No one will be tossed about. No one will be blown here and there by every wind of teaching. Instead, together, we will grow stronger. Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. And then, brothers and sisters, we will be able to serve without constantly being distracted by the fights amongst ourselves. Then we will be able to love our neighbors without 
constantly presenting a fractured Christianity to the world. Then we will be able to repent of our sins as churches and as Christians and move gently and humbly forward in the ministry of reconciliation that God has given us in Christ Jesus. then we will be able to learn truth without being afraid. Brothers and sisters, there is a calling here for us to serve with the gifts that we have been given. Yes, absolutely. And there is also a calling for us grow up. (laughs) And, And this is a calling for me, an ongoing calling for me. And it is an ongoing calling for you and for all of us too. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that be amazing if we could speak the truth in love, and grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. (laughs) Wouldn't that be great? Right? I don't have to worry about talking about the tough stuff with you, and you don't have to worry about it with me. You don't have to hide what you secretly believe, thinking that it might be uh, get you in trouble with other people in the church, but we could work through it together. We don't have to pretend like the Catholic Church that we can't release documents because they're too confidential. We could work for reconciliation within and without freely. Brothers and sisters, This is joyful news that we can and will grow up through Christ who is our head. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we know that you have called us to partner with you in our own growth. We know that on our own we are incapable of making even the smallest dent in our own sinfulness. But we know that through you, O Jesus, all things are possible. We know that through you and your spirit living within us, we too can grow to become mature. O God, may we together as community, as brothers and sisters in Christ, and may we as individuals together with you, O God, may we grow, may we live a life that is gentle and humble and bearing with one another. May we be patient with one another, and may we make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. May we grow beyond the divisions that have plagued us for so long and instead speaking the truth in love, may we grow to become in every respect the mature body of you, Jesus. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.